third principle of good government is the most promising method of securing a virtuous and morally stable people is to elect virtuous leaders. If you'll notice in the scripture, there are conditions given for people who are to be leaders in the church. They are to have their own stuff together and then you can lead others. So that was a very quick paraphrase of all that. But I want to begin this by reading something from George Washington. This was his farewell address because seriously, he was considered probably one of the most virtuous and moral men to ever lead this country. So what did he say? He said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. That is exactly what's happening now. It, there is an effort, it is pedal to the metal to eliminate this. And he said, you're, re you're crazy, it can't happen, you can't have a good life, you can't be a patriot, you can't do anything if you're going to try to rid yourselves of religion and morality. So he said, let it simply be asked, if you get rid of all that, where then is the security for property, for reputation, for life, if the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths which are the instruments of investigation in courts of justice? And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. All right, so what did Samuel Adams say? He said, neither the wisest constitution nor the wisest laws will secure the liberty and happiness of a people whose manners are universally corrupt. He, therefore, is the truest friend to the liberty of his country, who tries most to promote its virtue, and who, so far as his power and influence extend, will not suffer a man to be chosen into any office of power and trust who is not a wise and virtuous man. Let's just pause and mull over our current situation and say, hmm. Somewhere along the way, did we forget these principles? I would say yes. So, public officials should not be chosen if they were lacking in experience, training, proven virtue, and demonstrated wisdom. What does Proverbs 29 2 say? When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. So, who is the truest friend of liberty? It's the one who promotes virtue the one who seeks to elect only wise and virtuous people. So these people need to have proven fidelity. They, you have to know about the person. We have just experienced almost eight years of electing someone that no one knew anything about and all voices trying to let you get to know this person were silenced. So it has not been a good end here. So Madison had a quote in the Federalist Papers. He said, if men were angels, no controls on government would be necessary. And I think we know the answer to that. Men are not angels. So, how do you best develop public virtue? By having leaders of strong private virtue. Now, whatever you think of Rick Santorum, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. But he is one of these men that understands that these offices of leadership are bully pulpit. And he himself demonstrates public and private virtue. He's got his stuff together. He's got his family together. And he, will, he stands up and he promotes those values of, of being honest and hardworking and keeping your nuclear family intact. He, he's a guy who actually does that. So Jefferson spoke of a natural aristocracy. Remember, these people came from Europe. They loathed the monarchy and the aristocrats because they they just imposed burdens on the people and they stole from them and it was just 
horrible. So the natural aristocracy that Jefferson was looking for was one based, not based on inheritance or wealth or social status, but one based on virtue and talent and proven ability. And they had to have accomplished something as a private citizen. In fact, most of them did their public service free and they had their own jobs or trade or business. So they were living under any laws they were going to create, which makes a huge difference if you have to live under a law that you're going to create. So these people had all proven they could do something. So what should that say about today? Any person who has never done anything but be in politics their whole life, they've never run a business, they've never had any other job, nothing outside of politics, those people should be shunned. They sh you should run. You should get starting blocks and track shoes and get in them and run the opposite direction as fast as you can go away from these people. So you need people that have lived under the laws and understand what they're getting ready to do to the rest of the public. So the government that's best is the one that provides a pure selection process of natural aristide and puts them into the offices of government. So. How, how, what was their view of politics? Well, Cicero considered politics a godly function. And actually, you think about the scriptures talking about Jesus. It says the government will be upon his shoulders. So government isn't a bad thing. Just got to make sure you have good people with an understanding of good principles operating it. So Cicero said it's a godly function because it preserves people's rights and freedom. John Adams considered politics to be a divine science that was based on definite principles. Definite principles. And he said there was a natural progression of liberty, that he should study politics and war so that his sons could study math and philosophy, and then in turn their sons could study natural history and commerce and agriculture and then their children could study painting and poetry and music etc so uh, none of these were to be ignored at the expense of the others these were definite principles that were to be always reviewed and taught so um, and what was Benjamin Franklin's uh, view of public office Benjamin Franklin looked at public office as a post of honor for recognized accomplishments. It was not to be a post of profit to make money. So he always used George Washington as an example. Washington only wanted to be a farmer, that's it. But he was called by his countrymen to war, to the Constitutional Convention, to be a president. Um, as I said before, most public business was done gratis or done for free. Um, because Franklin understood, having lived and observed Europe, that there were two forces that would drive people, two passions that would drive people into public office. And the first one was, and Washington said this, government is force. That is what it is. So force, and then what other thing are you going to do where you have complete, complete control over people's lives and their money? So he said, men will move heaven and earth to attain this power of force and control over lives and money. So he had a prophecy. And let's read that prophecy. He said, sir, though we may set out in the beginning with moderate salaries, we shall find that such will not be of long continuance. Reasons will never be wanting for proposed augmentations, and there will always be a party for giving more to the rulers that the rulers may be able in return to give more to them. I don't know when in history you have ever seen that more than you are seeing that right now. People will literally go vote for someone who promises to take more from one group to give it to them. So... Hence, as all history informs us, there has been in every state and kingdom a constant kind of warfare between the governing and the governed. 
the one striving to obtain more for its support and the other to pay less. And this has alone occasioned great convulsions, actual civil wars ending either in dethroning of the princes or enslaving of the people. Generally, indeed, the ruling power carries its point and we see the revenues of princes constantly increasing and we see that they are never satisfied but always in want of more. What is that saying? There's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program? Always in want of more. The more the people are discontented with the oppression of taxes, the greater need the prince has of money to distribute among his partisans and pay the troops that are to suppress all resistance and enable him to plunder at pleasure. So I understood the evolution, which is not a good thing, the evolution of politics and where it can go if these posts, these public offices ever became places of profit. So. To, and to review, he said the bold and the violent would take over, salaries would go up, money and power would lead to a monarchy, you could co delay the trouble if you kept those public offices from being places of profit, and he always used George Washington as an example. Now, the Pennsylvania Constitution uh, required that every public official have a job, and then if too many people were running for an office, they would reduce the salary. So. How then would you develop character and virtue sufficient for this? Well, you would have to have a system of strong basic beliefs and you would have to have the courage to reject false philosophies. These notions of communism and socialism, these are not new. Remember Solomon said there is nothing new under the sun. There's always going to be envy and jealousy and even in the book of James, like, you have not because you ask not. When you do ask, you ask to miss. You're constantly warring and striving and clamoring and fighting and wanting what these other people have. Trust God. He loves you. He has an awesome life for you. He's, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. So it's a good life. You don't have to empower a group of politicians to steal from a, someone who has made and created wealth and redistributed to you for your happiness. Trust the Lord. So, um, and then finally you have to keep yourself serviceable and available. Be available to serve your country, to serve your people, right? He who would be greatest must be the servant of all.